right, good morning or good afternoon, uh, storage investors. Good to see everybody jumping into the webinar here. Um, glad to see everybody who's able to make it. Um, as folks are trickling in here, we're going to be talking a little bit about underwriting, which is uh, one of my favorite things, as I think you guys know. Um, so as everybody's coming in, let me know uh, where you are coming to us from. It's always nice to see uh, where everybody is signing in from and um, say hello. Uh, nice to think about the different facilities that we have uh, around the U.S. and um, just interesting to see. So I see Charles coming to us from New York. Uh, welcome, Charles. Uh, another uh, New York attendee. Uh, uh, glad to see everybody. San Antonio, Texas. Yep. Um, well, good. That's great. Uh, got folks um, uh, all over, uh, which is always fun. So, um, <clears throat> well, welcome to uh, the Storage Investor Nation webinar for this week. Today, we're going to be talking about back of the envelope underwriting. Um, we've talked, we've kind of alluded to this in the past, uh, maybe gone over a couple of things here and there. But I'm really excited to go over this today. Um, this is something that will save you a lot of time in your process of sourcing deals, and it'll enable you to better you know, allocate your time to the, the deals that will actually that you actually have a good shot at, at getting. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this today. So uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of um, things I like to go over. Um, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> share my screen here for a moment um, and just give you guys a look at um, a few things here. Um, if you're not part of our Facebook group, Storage Investor Nation, definitely recommend you checking that out. Um, just search for it here. Uh, and we're pretty pretty good about staying active. And you, you can even see some responses here that uh, my partner Chris has made. Um, so a lot of great content gets put out on there, a lot of good dialogue. So definitely recommend you check that out. Um, in addition to that, um, our website, PassiveInvesting.com, and I believe these links will be posted for you um, if they haven't already. Uh, this, um, th this is where you'll be able to find, you'll, you'll be able to see the current uh, deals that we've got in the pipeline, both multi and self-storage. You'll be able to meet the team here. Um, you see all of the partners, all of the um, employees, uh, and everybody kind of involved on our team. Um, and then you can also see, since we're talking about self-storage, um, you can see the details on our self-storage fund that we are um, deploying right now. So got a lot of great assets in there, got a lot of good ones under contract and uh, that are set to close soon. So check that out. Um, great information, great content. Um, so check those out when you get a chance. We also, if you're not subscribed to our podcast yet, the Storage Investor Nation podcast, uh, I highly recommend that as well uh, for content. That link should be posted as well for everybody um, shortly. So um, yeah, check those out. Facebook group, PassiveInvesting.com and the podcast. A lot of great content there that I think will be really beneficial to everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started for today. So welcome to our webinar on back of the envelope underwriting. So this is something that will save you a lot of time as you're going through the deal making process, the deal sourcing process specifically. Um, we're going to talk today um, kind of about at a high level what this is and what does it tell us. Uh, we'll talk about when you should do it. Um, it's always important to do this on pretty much every deal and we'll talk about that, the timing process there. We'll talk about what all you need to perform this analysis. It's really not nearly as much as you would need for a full underwriting, um, which is great. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll go through sort of a live, um, you know, be fairly quickly, but a, a, a live demo of, um, of doing some back of the envelope analysis. So uh, great topic for today, some great things planned. So let's get started. So first of all, what is this back of the envelope underwriting? Um, this is basically a summary, high-level analysis of, you know, a particular property. Um, so, you know, we, as we're looking for deals, we get, you know, constantly, wh whether it's from, you know, brokers who are marketing a deal, you know, we get tons of those emails. 
um, you know, tons of those, um, you know, communications that we have a deal that it comes across our desk. And we, it goes without saying, we, we can't spend the time, you know, the hour or two or three to underwrite every single one of those deals. We'd never be able to get it done and we never buy hardly anything. Um, it would just take up so much of our time and our time is valuable. All, everyone's time is valuable. But what this will tell you if you do this high level analysis is whether it's worth spending more time on a particular deal. And that way you can best allocate the time, the limited time that you have towards the deals that you have the best chance of winning. There's plenty of deals that will come across your desk that either A, don't meet the criteria that you have for one reason or another. Maybe they're not in the right market for you um, or, or maybe there's some other reason that it's just not a deal for you. And there's also plenty of deals that maybe they are great. Maybe they are in a target market. Maybe they're the right size that you're looking for, but they're asking way too much money uh, for the deal to work. So this is the, the latter situation there is what you'll often uncover when you're doing your back of the envelope analysis. So when should you do this? Generally, you should be clearing the market first. You don't want to do a, a good deal, so to speak, in a bad market. Um, so generally, you want to do that first, but you also want to do this before you do the full underwriting, because, again, that's what's going to take the most time. We want to make sure we're focusing our time on the right things. So you should do this before you do the full underwriting and generally after you have cleared the market, once you know this is a deal that you like. Um, the, the reason I say generally is because maybe if it's a market that is new to you, and you need to spend a little bit of time researching that market, it might be quicker to do this back of the envelope first. And if you run that back of the envelope and you realize, oh, there's no way this is going to work, then maybe you don't spend time getting to know that new market just yet until it's a better time to do so. So generally, after you've cleared the market is when you would do this analysis. Uh, but there, are, there may be instances where you would not necessarily need to do that first. You need to do it at some point, but maybe back of the envelope makes sense to do that sooner than studying a new market. So when we first started, when Chris and I first got started, uh, this was way back when, before we even, even um, partnered with PassiveInvesting.com, I, I was not as good about doing this on every deal as I should have been. You know, I was the one that was underwriting as I still am, Chris was the one who was always sourcing the deals. And I spent a lot of time on some deals that were never going to work and that I should have done a little bit of high level analysis first. We had a, a property in Concord, North Carolina that we were looking at as an example. I didn't do any back of the envelope on this before we did a full underwriting. We knew we really liked the market. It's near Charlotte, North Carolina, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, it was a great asset, and we were excited to look at the deal. Uh, and long story short, it was a $4 million asking price, and we could not get any higher uh, for our offer than about $3 million, 3.1. And we, we knew we wouldn't get the deal at that point, um, so we didn't want to give the seller some crazy low offer. So we kind of told him where we were, and you know that was fine. But I had wasted a lot of time doing that, spending time on that deal. Um, as a side note, it ultimately sold for just over 3.1 million. So we felt pretty good about where we came in. But still, we could have used those couple hours that it took to underwrite that looking for more deals that would fit our criteria. So again, the, the, the amount of time that we're spending is just so important. So that's, what, that's when we should do this. We should be doing this on pretty much any deal once we've cleared that this is a property that we like. Um, so that, that's when we want to be doing this. Now, next question that I want to talk about is how much information do we need to do this analysis? Because we've already said, you know, we don't need as much info as we need uh, to do a full underwriting, uh, which means we can do this a lot more quickly. Um, by the way, I see a question coming through here, and I did not mention at the beginning. If you do have questions as we go along, as usual, type them in the chat. Um, or in the Q&A box is another great spot. I'll do my best to monitor those as we're talking about this. And when I get to the end, if there's anything that I missed, we'll come back and make sure we hit everything 
uh, that everybody's had a question about. But I see the first question here, what is your go-to market source, CoStar um, or REIS? So what we use is Yardi Matrix. Uh, I think we may have talked a little bit about this uh, in prior webinars. Um, I'll do my best to, um, if, I, if I don't do this, please uh, remind me, Charles, but um, I'll do my best to uh, post a link to the website at the end of this webinar. Um, it's, it's not the cheapest information, but it can be more affordable depending on how many markets you are looking in. If you're looking in maybe just one metro area, um, it's, it's a lot more affordable than if you're looking at multiple different states or nationwide, for example. So um, Charles, if you can remind me if I forget, um, I'll do my best to post a link there. Um, there's other great, uh, great sources. Radius Plus is one. Um, CoStar does have some good information on there as well. We found that Yardi and Radius are generally the best out there for self-storage specifically, but there's other great ones that, um, that you've listed there. Um, so that's, our, that's what we use for market sourcing generally. So how much information do we need to do the back of the envelope analysis? We really just need a handful of things. One is you need the address for the property, um, which is pretty easy to get. Uh, you need to know the net rentable square footage. So how much, how much square footage is available to be rented by tenants. And you need to know kind of the general status of the property. And what I mean by that is, are you looking at a property that was built you know, last year and is still going through lease up? Or are you looking at something that's 10 years old, may need a little bit of CapEx, but you know, it's, it's other, otherwise a stabilized property. Um, and the reason you need to know that is it will help you with what your debt assumptions are. So if you're buying a property in lease up, then that's going to be a different type of loan than a property that is, you know, pretty much fully stabilized and you're just taking it over to, you know, make some cash flow. Um, so that you'll, you'll want to know kind of a general, what's, what, where is this property in its life cycle? So you'll need to know that. And then you'll also need to know, finally, the asking price for the property. You'll need to know how much they want. Um, I know Chris has talked before about working with brokers. So, so sometimes they might tell you what the list price is. Other times you might have to call them and say, hey, you know, what does the seller really want for this? But one way or another, you need to know kind of what price you need to hit. And uh, once you have these things, then you can do this back of the envelope analysis. You'll have to make a few assumptions that we'll go over in just a second here, uh, such as what your debt terms are, your expense ratio. Um, and like I said, we'll go over that, but that's really the main information that you need. So you need to know where's the property located, the address, and you need to know the net rentable square feet, and you need the kind of a general understanding of what the where it is in its life cycle and the asking price as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a, um, an analysis here that we did. It was kind of similar to a property uh, that we recently um, were underwriting. Um, I see another question. Are there good underwriting classes that someone can take online or offline? Uh, yes, uh, there are a few. One of them that I highly recommend is... Uh, um, it's uh, kind of sponsored by the Self Storage Association. Um, I will I'll post a link to that as well when we get to the end here. Um, but yes, that that would be a great um, a, a great class for you to take if you'd like to get a little bit more or a lot more down into the weeds on how to underwrite storage, how to build a model for storage, that kind of thing. So good good question, and y'all do um, I will post the link for that at the end as well. So I will pull up this uh, this underwriting. You might recognize when we get to the actual analysis part of this, you might recognize this from uh, a webinar that my partner Chris has done on underwriting. And I actually have a link for that that I'll post at the end as well. So what I've done here is I've just kind of got um, a little bit of information that we got from the seller on this property. Um, this was a little while back, but um, this was a property that it was about 24,000 net rentable square feet. Uh, it was all climate controlled and it was about 90% occupied. So it was pretty high occupancy um, at rents that were below market. You know, this, it was sort of a mom and pop type seller. 
hadn't really raised rents in a very long time, you know, and we could tell that there was a little bit of room to do so. Um, so of course, I got the address for this facility, and then I knew that they wanted $5 million for it. So I'm going to move over to the analysis tab. Um, and if anyone has, has trouble uh, seeing this, let me know, but um, move over to the analysis tab here. So again, you might recognize this from, uh, from a prior webinar that we've done, but what I have got is the net rentable square feet, um, 24,000. Um, I knew that they wanted $5 million for this. So the next thing I'm looking at here is what, what debt terms do I think I could get? So I think that it's pretty safe that I could get about 65% leverage on a property like this that's pretty much stabilized, just needs to increase the rents. So I'm gonna say um, 35% equity here. Uh, my um, spreadsheet automatically calculates the 65% debt that we're looking at. And then I need to know what are my debt terms. Now, again, a stabilized property, I could get a better rate than this. So I'm to be a little bit conservative for today. I'm going to say I can get a 4% rate um, for five year uh, for a five-year loan and an amortization of about 25 years. So by knowing these things or making these assumptions, I can tell what, what is the debt payments that I'm going to be making um, at, an, on an annual basis. Uh, for um, for this property, for this loan. Then I need to know what is my, uh, what, what, what do I need to earn on this property? You know, whether it's for me or if I've got partners, what, what do I need to pay my investors for this property? So I've decided for this one, I would like to pay everybody at least 7% per year. So now what I know is that to in, if I invest, you know, this is the cash on cash return, which we've talked about before. So if I'm investing $1,750,000 of equity up here, which is my 35% down payment on this property, and I need to earn 7% on that, then I need to be able to earn $122,500 per year on this property. So now we're going to say, well, can we do that? Well, what I did is, and I already pulled these, but I looked, uh, I looked this facility up and I found that there were about three uh, comparable properties in the trade area there. So what I did is I looked those up and I looked at the rates that they are charging right now for uh, 10 by 10 units. Sometimes depending on what the unit mix of a property looks like, when we get to a full underwriting, we might look for a few types in addition to the 10 by 10s, but generally for self storage, kind of your gold standard in terms of comps is going to be what are the rents for 10 by 10s. It's just on average, that's what most people look at. So that's what I did. And I found these three that were within the trade area of this property that were kind of similar class assets. So these were my best three comps. And when I went online, uh, made some calls uh, to the facilities that I had to. I found that this extra space storage, right now they're charging $137 a month. Uh, and then of course these other two, public storage and safe storage, they're charging about 120 and 103 respectively. So when I average all of these together, I'm looking at about $120 a month for a 10 by 10 unit, which is about $1.20 per square foot. So if I go, th this is my analysis that th this is what I can, Again, this is high level. I, I haven't done you know, a super detailed look at these particular facilities, but I know that based on these being what look to be good comps, it looks like I can probably get about $1.20 per foot in rent per month. So I'm gonna go back over here to my analysis and I'm gonna say that I think I can get $1.20 per square foot. So based on my 24,000 square feet that we found out here at the beginning, that would mean I, I'm gonna collect about 345,000 in, in gross revenue. And, or I shouldn't say collect, I should say that the gross revenue for this property would be about 345,000. Now we've got to think about our vacancy. So units that are empty, units that are rented below market. And let's say that I, I think I'm probably gonna be about 85% 
um, economically occupied. So of the, if everybody, uh, if everything was full at market rates, it'd be 345,000. I think that between vacant units and units that are below market, I'm probably gonna be losing about $50,000 here, 51,000. So then I've got my effective revenue here. So that's the cash that I actually think I'm gonna collect from my tenants. Then I need to think through how many, what my expenses are gonna be. And again, we're not looking really specific at, you know, what am I gonna spend on maintenance? What am I gonna spend on insurance? We're just looking high level. Does it make sense to look at this deal any further? And generally for storage, you're gonna have about 30% on the, it would be the low side for sure. Uh, you might have 40% on the higher side. Uh, we've talked about estimating expenses before. If you check out Storage Investor Nation, you'll see a, a few webinars where we go into that a little bit deeper uh, that, um, that could be helpful to you as you make this assumption. But I'm going to say that I think I'm going to be about 35% at my expense ratio. So of the cash that I collect, I'm going to spend about 35% of it on expenses. So 293,000 in cash I'm collecting, 102,000 in expenses means my net operating income is gonna be about 190,000. Well, if I look at the, the cost of paying my loan, the debt service, which comes out after net operating income, you know, I found out over here, it's gonna be about $200,000 or $205,000 a year. I'm not making any money on this, I'm losing $15,000 a year, making the loan payments and paying my expenses based on what, what the rent it looks like I'll be able to make here. So in this case, I'm not even close to my 7%, I'm negative. And this is at $1.20 per foot per month in revenue. Um, I've got a couple of other little uh, ratios here that we can look at. One of them, you can see the, the cap rate we're not going to go into that in detail right now, but I can see I would it at if I paid five million dollars for this property, I would be paying a 382 cap rate uh, per foot. I'm paying 208 dollars, and those are a couple of things that could potentially be some yellow flags or red flags in this deal from the beginning. Uh, we're going to do a webinar on that later about as you're doing this analysis, you, even before you get to this analysis, are there any kind of yellow flags or you know, if you see this right at the beginning, it's probably a good sign this deal is not going to work. Um, we'll, we'll go into that uh, in a future webinar. But based on this analysis that I've done, it looks like I'm not even close. So I'm not going to spend the time on doing a full underwriting of this deal. I'm not going to look at the rent roll and the occupancy reports to see, you know, all of the details, all the nuts and bolts. I'm not going to do a full study of those comps that I would normally do if I did a full underwriting because my time is going to be better spent elsewhere. So I'm going to either pass on this deal or what I'll probably do is I'll get back to the seller or if it's coming from a broker, I'll get back to the broker and I'll tell him, hey, you know, I, I can't even get close to that, uh, you know, and may maybe there's a reason for it, but well, I would just tell him, you know, I'm not going to be close to that. Maybe I might say, okay, if I were to pay, you know, four million, would I be closer? You know, um, I'm I'm in the I'm at least in the positive there. But um, anyway, I, I might come up with a price that I think would work. Or what I could do, and this is going back to again that bottom up underwriting that I referred to before. Um, that I've got I've got a link for that that I'll post at the end. Uh, this is, I got to give uh, Chris, my partner, credit for this. He's, he's good at um, thinking through things this way. But this analysis, which you may have seen before, is going to tell me what rent I would need to be able to get in order to pay $5 million for this. So this, and this particular spreadsheet is all, all of these are all calculated. I don't need to do anything other than fill in this missing information over here that we just did. But this will kind of go through the same process and the formula is such that it will tell me, okay, in this property, you can see, I think I'm gonna get about $1.20 per foot. I would have to be getting over $2 a square foot in gross revenue for this to be a deal that I could do 
and pay my investors 7%. So I can see I'm way off of that. I'm barely half of that at this point. So again, can't spend any time on, on this deal because I just know it's not even gonna be close. But what I could do is I could tell the seller, you know, hey, here's why I can't even get close here is based on the market. It looks like I'm going to need to get $2 a foot in rent. And, you know, you're only getting this $1.20 here. So that way you can give them some feedback on why the deal doesn't work for you. So this is an example of going through this whole bottom up underwriting um, and then the top down, you know, which is what we spent most of our time on. This is an example of how to go through this analysis and how it can save you a lot of time going through the deal sourcing process. So again, generally we want to clear the market first and unless it's maybe a new market for you, and then you'll be doing this analysis and you'll be able to determine, is it even worth spending my limited and valuable time on pursuing this deal? I'm gonna take a second here and look for any questions that have come up. Um, see a question, is the quick analysis template available to purchase? So I think this template is actually on the Facebook group, um, but I will make a note uh, myself to check that out. Um, and if it is, I will, um, I'll, I'll make a note, I'll, I'll uh, make maybe repost it in the Facebook group so everybody can see it there, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's uploaded there. Um, another question I see coming in, would you share the spreadsheet with us by sending it to our email? Um, I'll tell you what, uh, if, if, you, if you check out the Storage Investor Nation website or uh, Facebook page that's been posted in there, um, that's what I would recommend doing because I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure the file's already there, but if not, I'll make sure it does get there. Um, let's see. Uh, why did you pick the middle of the road 35% expense ratio? Would it be better to be conservative and calculate based on 40%? Um, that's the question that I like is, um, should we be conservative? Generally, yes, you would de definitely want to be. What I would say, Eric, at this point is, um, you know, again, this is the high level analysis. This isn't the really detailed. So if I, you know, if I, if I use 35%, and, you know, in this case, I wasn't even close, you know, then I'm not going to assume that I can do 30, you know, to make this deal work. If I'm not even close at 35, I'm not going to spend any time on this deal. Uh, but what, what I would, when I would kind of do the 35, 40, or kind of fine tuning that is when I go through the full underwriting and I would look at, okay, what am I going to spend on, you know, the management of the property, the maintenance and all that. Um, but generally, yes, I, I always come in on the conservative side of my assumptions because you want to make sure that, you know, you're not underwriting something on a best case scenario. So, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question there. Um, I think that's all that I see coming in. Um, let's see, I see one. I have ground up development opportunities. Would this be an opportunity type? Um, you can speak with us. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to uh, shoot us a note on Facebook, that would probably be the best way to get started there. Um, be happy to um, spend some time talking with you about that. All right, I don't see any other questions coming through. Looks like I hit everything. Um, Okay, um, all right, I will go ahead and post some of those links that I was referring to. Um, I can do right now, I had in a note, the one on um, the underwriting webinar where we go over this back of the envelope analysis. Um, put this in here now. Uh, so check that out. Um, but, uh, yep, looks like that's all the questions. Oh, I actually see two more. How would you calculate an expansion with this model? So that's a good question. Um, you can build a sort of a back of the envelope with expansion. Um, it would take a little bit of time to do that. I've, I've done it before and, uh, we just ha haven't used it in a little while. Um, 
with the as far as what I would recommend doing there, um, I think you would. Uh, I, I think what I would do is I would go ahead and use something like this model that we just did today, and complete it, assuming that the expansion is already done. So you know, if there's 10,000 square feet there now, and you're going to expand another 10,000 square feet, run this analysis, assuming that you have 20,000 square feet and just see what the return looks like once the expansion is done. That's what I would recommend doing first. And if it, if it looks like the return is great there, and it should be great because you know, you're gonna spend some time actually building the, um, the, the expansion, you're gonna spend some time leasing it up. So your kind of that stabilized back of the envelope uh, return should look pretty good at that point because you know you're gonna the return is going to take a little bit of a hit because of the time that it takes you to get that expansion in place. So that's that's what I would recommend doing is doing something simple like this, and that way it, it can kind of help you know okay does it make sense to do a full underwriting? Um, how do we find the quick analysis on Facebook? Um, looking don't see okay if it's not up there I'll make sure that it gets uh, posted for you guys. Um, it'll, it'll be a really handy tool I think to use. So. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Make sure you go to the Storage Investor Nation website to sign up for next week's webinar. Um, but until then, um, hope everybody has a great week. Thanks for joining us.